or the Lindale School. So there's not been any formal um, approach, discussion about consulting on closure previously. But the uncertainty which, which led to the parents putting forward uh, could we become a 2 to 19 school and that then subsequently not proceeding must, I guess, have caused some uncertainty. What I do know from looking at the um, children who currently attend Lindale School, although there are small numbers, there are children in, in virtually every key stage. So it's not that the parents and the community out there have unanimously said, or anyone being directed in that way, that it's not open for business because children have started the school but it is a small number. Um, and the school over a period of time has become more specialised and focusing on um, a small group of children with uh, profound and multiple learning difficulties. Which if I could just very briefly add, that isn't a group of children that have expanded in number. We look back retrospectively over the last four years and that number taking the, the naught to, I think it's two to 19 year olds, have been uh, 58 one year, 63, 62, and 59. So it is a relatively small group of, of very vulnerable youngsters. Just to follow up on the points of that, do you feel that the consultation and what we're doing at the moment is going to exacerbate the situation even further that we're highlighting that this is an issue and that will ultimately result in the conclusion that we should close the school because the consultation itself is putting people block because they know that the school potentially won't close and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Chair, I think it's, it's a difficult balance, it's chicken and egg. I think we have the reduction in numbers over time. So we've, we've 23 children, I think it's the lowest number of children we've had at the school over the last <coughs> 10 years that we've looked at. So there has to be some concern about the viability of the school. I think we'd be not acting appropriately not to embark on a consultation. And I think there is some uncertainty, and certainly embarking on a consultation causes even more uncertainty, but we have to make a decision. Uh, it feels once and for all about how we proceed. Just my, my second question is, uh, Stanley School and Hillary Park as far as I know, were both available at the time of the children of Lindale receiving their statements. So why would the decision be made to send them to Lindale School rather than any of the other schools? And how has that changed now that it would be more beneficial for them to go to Stanley School or Ellen uh, Park? Um, I think at the time that children, um, decisions were made involving parents, uh, other professionals, that children went to Stanley School, that, that would be um, the right school for those children at that time. In terms of um, future, if, and I caveat this all with an if, because we, we haven't even embarked on consultation yet, but if, if Lindale closed, and if the schools that children would go to in future were Stanley School and were Emory Park School, both of those schools would have to change in nature to be the right schools for children with for uh, family and multiple learning difficulties. We already know, we already know that, that Ellery Park does uh, care for and educate children with family and multiple learning difficulties and some parents choose that their children go there. One child is still currently Stanley caters for children who are primarily have complex needs but on the autistic spectrum. It's a danger to our children. If children in future... Please, if, if we could just not interrupt, it would be really appreciative of that. Thank you. If children were in future to go to Stanley School, there would need to be changes in that school to make that setting right for the children uh, who are currently going to Lindale School. Just my final question, yeah. picks up on what you asked. Uh, do you feel that parents have been given the answers because of received from the comments from the audience? It seems that they don't feel like they have been given the answers that they've asked for from their questions. And so how can, how, can, how can they have faith in the fact that council's uh, consultation process will give them the answers that they want them? 
Um, I'm really keen to really understand the questions that the parents have asked. And if the answers I've provided so far don't properly respond to those questions, it might not be the answers that people like sometimes, but I need to fully make sure that I've understood the question and responded. So I'll certainly speak to Mrs. Hughes, I'll speak to any parent as part of the process going forward uh, to really make sure me and my officers understand the questions asked to make sure that the responses properly answer those questions. John. You said a very quick question. It has to be quick. Well, I'll be very quick. Why can't the schools board and all the council agree what money the school? It's, it's a good question. If we could have with us, we'd encourage you to do it. But there's two, there's two parts to the question. Clearly, the schools forum would have to take decisions to alter the banding to put more money particular way to the school. It's a fixed amount of money. The schools forum would have to agree to it. And as I said right at the beginning, um, it would mean that other children in the other bands want to fall if there'd be less money for those. So in terms of moving money around within the school's budget, you, 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 you can do that. We can't do it. The schools forum can discuss it. We could repeat all the process we've had with the consultation of the working groups that came up with the family, the external consultants and so on. You currently put two amounts of money additional into the budget, or you did. The school's budget is ring fence from the government grant. You currently, as a council, put two amounts in, or you did do. There was an extra, some very, very modest amount put in for plan preventative maintenance to help that, and there was an amount of money, 2.6 million pounds, put in to support the private finance initiative contract. Um, the PPM monies were taken out as part of the need to make savings, and the PFI money, the private finance money, is, has been reduced and will be taken out next year. So in line with most councils across the country, the council will not be putting any money to add to the school's budget um, at that point. So it would have, you'd have to be discussion and consensus and the repeat of the process we've got through to reallocate the money into a different formula to, to actually put more money into a particular plan. In terms of the council putting more money in, yes, you, you could do that. You can't, you couldn't give us the money and say, put it in the pocket and distribute it through the formula because it wouldn't all make its way to Linda because the formula clearly distributes the money to other places. So if you gave us the money and said, put that money in, distribute the formula, you could, we couldn't get it just to Linda. That, that isn't how the formula works because the principle of the money follows pupils on places. Other than that, you'd have to somehow take an amount of council money and just direct it round the formula and put it into the school. And in 24 years of local management of schools, you haven't done that. And you haven't done it, I suspect, for a very good reason, because clearly you can't fail to sit in this room and you would want to do that straight away. But if you do that for one school, you will have a queue. And some of them might sound very mundane and very boring things, but they will be very big amounts of money. So the, the, in the past, you, you have helped out particular schools where they've had fires, floods, one-off events where you've had a group of staff, you've had a cluster of staff suspended for whatever reasons, and they've taken the relief on their budget. That's either come from a contingency within the school's budget, or it's come from the school improvement grant where we've got money that we've diverted away from purposes of the schools. They've been one-offs. So through the formula, you can't get the money into just the one school. If you put money in separate to that, you would be doing that for the first time. And you would, if you were, for example, a chair of governors or a parent at an elder park, for example, wouldn't you come along and say, well, actually, we've got a case too. And there'd be other schools queuing up for different reasons to say, well, actually, we've got a case as well. So it, it, it sounds very bureaucratic and cold, but that's the reason <coughs> it's been done before. Okay. Um, the couple of questions really going back to the uh, reasons behind the calling um, why we shouldn't consult there was reference made to a council minute uh, Monday the 14th 2011 um, which talked for, uh, not specifically about Lindale um, but I think was prompted by and around the debates going on at that time um, I want to know 
what work was done on that and whether it was helpful and whether it was considered in your considerations as officers in making your decision. The second reference similarly and has been mentioned is the work by uh, Mr. Craven, is it? Uh, from, from the notes, from the calling uh, notes. Yeah. Yeah, and um, the work by Mr. Craven uh, and how that was used in, in the debate, because that's one of the specific reasons for calling it. And then I've got a couple of other questions around that. The first issue I'm referring to the, hand, the, the written evidence given by Tom Harney, where it talks about a minutes of council, which I apparently seconded, well, which I did second, I'm not that with the information. Okay, um, I'm familiar with the um, council minutes of Monday the 14th of February uh, and what was resolved. And um, it was recommended that a review to be presented to Cabinet by the end of 2011. And Cabinet uh, on the 12th of January 2012 uh, actually received a report entitled a Review of Wills Provision for Children and Young People with Profound and Multiple Learning Difficulties and Disabilities. Um, and that review was undertaken as a consequence of that resolution. Um, it was a review done in two phases. And phase one was a review of the current services received by children and young people with uh, profound and multiple learning difficulties. And phase two uh, was that if a set of recommendations were accepted by Cabinet, um, they, they would be followed through and um, completed by a, a group, a project group, comprising officers and parents. And there were 11 recommendations in total, um, and each of those recommendations were followed through, uh, and they were accepted at that cabinet meeting uh, on the 12th of January 2012. And they concerned things like home to school transport, the management of transition, information pilots, um, making sure that the adequacy of the physical environment of the schools was kept um, at the forefront of people's minds, uh, better prioritising of families' planning applications, uh, making sure that um, the key worker system was implemented, and those recommendations were all followed through, um, and a, a report of that action which took place between January 2012 and December 2012 um, was written up and circulated um, kind of mid last year to members of the steering group and the sponsor. I think it's also important to note, and that was the, the recommendations were from the University of Chester, that the group that followed through those recommendations made reference to the fact that the government was changing quite radically its approach to special educational needs and funding and planning for children. Um, but also it's noteworthy that none of the recommendations uh, dealt with by the group directly touched on the number of places in school uh, and how funding would operate. So that's how that set of recommendations were, were followed through and implemented. With respect to um, Eric Craven, who was the HMI, um, he produced a couple of reports. Uh, one report that the local authority paid for um, where he did some work directly with um, Lindale School. Um, and this was to look at um, a reduction, how, as the school reduced from 45 to 40 places, the school staffing could be reconfigured to take account of the needs of the children. Um, and I have a copy of the report that was produced at that time by Mr. Craven, who felt that the school were taking very sensible steps and their proposed revised staffing arrangements would meet the needs of the, the children who were currently attending the school. And he spoke about the proportion of children who needed assistance with going to the toilet or lifting or wheelchair users. So he focused on the current cohort at that time um, and said that the school, perhaps with its proposed staffing ratio, could accommodate a couple more children, but uh, the staffing ratio was fit for the purpose. The second report, which was commissioned by the local authority, uh, was completed on the 24th of April 2013. And Eric Craven, who's got a lot of expertise in working particularly with children with as an inspector of children with profound and multiple uh, 
learning disabilities and complex learning disabilities, was asked to um, look at how health supporters develop the banding system, and particularly band five, and look at some of the needs of the children at the higher end of band five. And he came up with a, 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 an approach um, to looking at how we might characterize some of that, those more vulnerable children. And he talked about three aspects. Um, children who, um, on, on progress scales of, of educational development, were at the lower stages of one to three. Pupils requiring gastronomy, uh, gastrostomy feeding, and pupils unable to sit and aided and walk even with assistance. So his definition of those children, he found the majority of children with that level of vulnerability were at Lindale School, but at that time there were a small number of children at um, Ellery Park School also. And he concluded that he felt both schools could meet the needs of, of those children. And that definition helped him form um, five plus in the banding system. My final question is, it's in, in, it's in a couple of parts. I would like your opinion if we resolve to do nothing, what you feel the outcome of that may be. The second thing that seems to be, from certainly the parents who've given evidence to me, is that this potential move to another premises school environment it is the thing that is, is filling them with fear. Um, but the inevitability of this school, given its age range, that the children will move to another school at some time during the school life. And I'm, I'm mindful of what support packages done during that transition and what support packages would be given if there was any other transition before then that normal leaving date from the school. I think if you decide to do nothing, um, it's difficult at the moment to see that the uncertainty would not carry on because currently the school is being funded on 40 places and until quite recently it was funded for 45. And as I've, as I've said, I won't be able to detail again, it's the confidence that you can have in a system carrying on where you are reliant on funding empty places to keep the school going in a setting where the national framework is changing, moving more to uh, pupils rather than places, and also where it's very reliant on a local arrangement whereby the schools and the chairs of governors and the parents are accepting that the money is distributed in that way. So it's, it's the degree of confidence you can have in that. Really, you know, we, 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 we like to think that we've, in the background, we've, Andrew in particular, and working with part of the schools for only the heads, have come up with ways of keeping that going over in recent years. If you tell us to go away and do that, we will try it. At the moment, we are sufficiently worried about it and concerned about it, clearly, that we brought this matter to you. There's, there's no easy answer here. Um, right, um, correct me if I'm not going along the right lines. Um, in terms of transition, um, th th there was a proposal previously, uh, two or three years ago, um, that was looked at in some great detail about a proposal put forward by the parents of children at Lindale that the school should be considered to become a 2 to 19 school and that was based on concern about children needing to transition uh, to a secondary school and I think as I understand it that perhaps children would stay behind uh, for longer at Lindale until they were ready to, to make that transition. There was a consultation um, about that proposal and the outcome of the consultation was that it was primarily the parents from the Lindale School that, that favoured that option. Yeah. Parents were considered, parents were consulted from the two secondary schools at Foxfield and Meadowside, and they, largely from what I've read, were saying they felt that their children did manage to make that transition and that move to the secondary school was properly handled and supported. Um, if, many an if in this, if the proposal, if it did proceed to a consultation on closure, if eventually a decision was, and there's lots of ifs in this, that if the school should close, 
then that transition for each and every individual child would have to be managed especially carefully and the confidence of parents in any new provision would be absolutely at the forefront of all the professionals' minds um, to make sure that was effective as properly as possible. I'm not sure that covers your question. So we now move on to the next phase of, of um, the scrutiny committee's work, and that is to ask back again uh, the, the, the summary of the lead signatory and potential questions to, to, to him. So, um, Tom. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. And can I start off by thanking you for the question you asked about the, re the resolution of the Council on the 14th of February 2011. And if we're talking about the confidence in the process, then this is in fact, as you said, arose, this arose out of a petition organised by parents of the school. There was work done, and I referred to that before, Julia has now referred to it. What I'm saying in terms of our calling, that information, which is recent information, should in fact have been a major part of the issue about the Linda School. That work has been done, the information is there, why isn't it in this paper? Why aren't the papers referred to as supporting documents so that everybody can see it? Why are we sitting here listening to selected bits of it rather than having the whole paper? The council paid for it, why haven't we got it? That might be one of the reasons why people are not confident in the process. And I think that, you know, if you're looking at a way forward, the first thing is to make sure that everything is put into, it's already the public domain, of course, it is not all that easy to Google through lots and lots of uh, papers on the internet. It should be here, it should be listed, and that is one of the things that's absolutely vital. The next thing is complex and learning, di complex learning difficulties. Complex learning difficulties, of course, in this borough, and unfortunately, most of these phrases don't have a standard uh, meaning in the country. So, complex learning difficulties is basically children on the autistic spectrum and children with profound and multiple learning difficulties. They have different needs. Children with profound and, profound, uh, and multiple learning difficulties need stimulation. They need color, they need sound, and so on. Children on the autistic spectrum basically need uh, a more subdued environment, they need calming down rather than stimulating, and they're different. So to conflate the two is not very helpful. And Julie has mentioned the work done by Eric Crane, but most of the children on the extreme profound <coughs> multiple learning difficulties are in fact in the Lindale School and are being catered for. So that's the first thing. And the other one is, and I'm not really anticipating what's going to be said, the next debate, but I am talking about what has been said by our officers. And I think we need to cut away a lot of the um, irrelevancies and look at what's really happened in this borough over the years. And I'm not in any way sort of criticising people because there is a national problem about the funding of um, special education needs and in particular special schools. So, you know, I don't want to personalise it. I think there is danger in that because we're talking about children, vulnerable children. We're not talking about ourselves, and I think, as one of those who actually helped um, present the petition and actually wrote the uh, motion, which you can't dissect it, Chair, um, we have to take responsibility, and we all have to take responsibility. It's our joint responsibility. It isn't a faction or anything else. We have to take responsibility. But the reality of what's happened is this, and I've followed the funding for a long time now, because I've um, been a member of the governing body at um, Linda ever since it was at Clatterbridge and have followed through. The funding given for children in profound and multiple languages per child has not been enough. It never has been enough. And as we'll explain, 
and you forgive me, I'm trying to think of the word that doesn't say horse trading. Um, it has been done by negotiation, the formula and set has been done by negotiation between head teachers and to some extent governors. That is what has happened. There was a review, and I can't remember when, it was quite a long time ago now, when somebody was brought up from East Anglia, an expert who did a review. After it went through the process of consultation with schools, there was almost no change. There was one change, I think. And we had the situation where a small number of people, a small number of children with profound multiple engines, were not getting enough money per child. So what happened was that the number of, if the place, places were defined as more than the number of children, so therefore you might have 25 children, 40 places, or whatever it was, 45 at one time, and more before that. So, but what we are saying is this, when you listen to what the children need and what happens in the classroom, you can easily quantify, you can easily measure how many adults you need. That translates into a cost, and that cost is too much to be paid for by the amount per child that you've been offered. That's the situation. There is not enough money per child to pay for the adults that are needed. That would mean if you put another 10